Hello, in this video we are going to be trying to answer the question, or we're going to try to answer the question, what fuels the sun? And this was the, exactly the question that was on the lips of astronomers in the early 20th century, and they were not sure how on earth it could produce this much energy. They'd worked out its temperature, and they'd worked out its composition by studying the light of it and they were also able to tell how much energy it was releasing and originally they thought or people thought of stars as balls of burning gas um, so if it's, if it's burning that means combustion must be taking place but if you looked at how much energy it was producing and if you did a calculation on what was in there and the rate of consumption there was no way that it could be combustion it couldn't possibly be combustion just the maths did not work out there must be some other process going on inside here for this star to be producing as much energy as it does and to last for as long as it does so combustion wasn't wasn't the answer and scientists needed to find out what was the answer so what they knew at the time they knew its temperature they knew its composition let me just focus on this a bit they knew that it's mostly made up of hydrogen the sun but also with a significant amount of helium and this was information that they'd they taken from looking at the spectra so it's mostly hydrogen and helium and they needed to find out how is this hydrogen and helium used or combined to produce such a large amounts of energy and it was in the early part of the 20th century that there was a lot of uh, research going into studying atoms, protons, neutrons and what happens when they're combined on, on a very very small level and what's happening inside the nucleus of an atom. In fact that whole area of physics was called nuclear physics and it was when nuclear physics was really starting to take off that somebody thought well hang on a minute these nuclear effects that we're thinking about here perhaps that what that is what explains what's going on inside the sun. What they realized or what we eventually realized was that there is a, a nuclear process called nuclear fusion and it is nuclear fusion which provides the vast majority of the energy that is produced by the sun nuclear that just means of the nucleus so this is the nucleus or nuclei that's the plural the nuclei of atoms and fusion is when two things join together and essentially what happens inside nuclear fusion is that two nuclei fuse to produce something larger and when they fuse together and produce something larger they also release large amounts of energy we end up with something heavier at the end we release some energy and this process can be well we've got quite a complex one here this is called the the proton proton chain and as we can see here we've got our red particles are the protons, neutrons in grey, positron, a positron is just a, a positive electron, it's the antiparticle of an electron, and gamma ray, and gamma ray is, we know, well gamma, that's part of the electromagnetic spectrum isn't it, and if you're releasing a ray that's energy is being given off. And this picture here, this shows the proton-proton chain where we start off in a star with hydrogen particles and we end up way down here after a few different um, fusion processes have gone together we end up with a particle down here that's got two protons and two neutrons this is an alpha particle or a helium atom with a mass of four and a proton number of two and this is the main process that takes place inside the sun to produce lots and lots of energy for us. So first up, when does fusion happen? The reason we didn't know about it on Earth and the reason that we, we couldn't guess that this was going on at first is because it only happens in extreme circumstances. It only happens at extremely high temperatures and pressures. So extremely high temperature and pressure the forces acting on the 
um, hydrogen atoms must be extremely, extremely huge to squash them together. Because if you think about it, what we've essentially got here, if, if we're looking at this one in the dotted line here, we've got two positively charged particles. And we know, obviously, if you try to bring these two particles together, they are going to be, well, they're going, they're going to be repulsing each other because opposites attract, a positive and a negative would attract each other, but two like charges are going to repel each other. So this is called electrostatic electrostatic repulsion. So these these two particles should be forcing away from each other and should never really, by rights, get close enough to join together. But through studying nuclear physics and through uh, putting these particles into extremely high temperature and pressure environments, what can happen is that if you get them sufficiently close, so say for example if they're this far away, we get repulsion and they they just will not join together, but if we can somehow force them so they're only this far away, then what we find is particles that get close enough to each other, even though they've got their force of repulsion that's pushing them away, they've got their electrostatic repulsion still, that still exists, in fact look, it's an even larger force because they're so close together, but once they get sufficiently close, there is a new force that comes into play and has an extremely significant impact and this is called I'll draw it in yellow here the strong nuclear force and it only becomes the dominant force if two particles come close enough together I've drawn those in yellow but I'm going to write this in black so you can see it the strong nuclear force And if, if we've got a high enough temperature and pressure and we can overcome the electrostatic repulsion, then we can force these close enough together so that the strong nuclear force gets them to attract together. And if that force of attraction is large enough, then they can actually fuse together. So how does fusion release energy? Where does the energy actually come from in fusion? Well, what happens is if we look at the masses of our particles that we as we start off with, so what I'll say is I'll call these the mass initial, and then if we look at the mass of the particles afterwards, which I'll call the mass final, what we notice is that these are not equal. The total mass at the beginning is not equal to the total mass at the end. So there is a change in mass and what happens is that mass is converted into pure energy now this this seems absolutely crazy you know we it just does it seems absolutely crazy but this is what happens energy and mass are equivalent to each other they're essentially the same thing just in different forms and this famous ubiquitous equation explains this really nicely that energy and mass are equivalent and in this case we can use this to work out how much energy is produced with this equation the energy produced in a fusion reaction is equal to the change in mass or the, the difference in mass between the final and initial masses of these two multiplied by the speed of light squared and this is used to work out how much energy is released in that instant now this is the, the reasons for this are, are complex and still not understood fully. This is this is something that we can observe and we can measure and we know that this equation works but we're still trying to get to the truth of why this is the case. So we're still There's still mysterious things going on inside atoms that we don't understand but it is definitely true that we can use this relationship. Energy is equal to the change in mass multiplied by the speed of light squared and that describes one of these fusion reactions. Now something that we have to be able to do with this um, 
with these fusion reactions is to write symbol equations for them to show what's going on. So I'm going to have a look at a couple of scenarios. Now, I can't predict exactly the form that you're going to get them in an exam question, but what we do need to remember is it's very similar to doing normal chemical equations. You need to make sure that you conserve the number of particles on either side of your equation and you must conserve charge. So you need to have the same charge on one side of the equation as the other and you need to have the same number of particles on one side of the equation as the other. So let's start off with this This one I've drawn the dotted line around. We st at the beginning we've got two hydrogen particles and we end up with here. Well, What is this first of all? This is it's got one proton so it's still hydrogen but it's also got a neutron so this is actually called deuterium it's a, an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium what else do we have we've got a gamma particle that's some energy and a positron so what I need to do is be able to draw this equation so I start off with hydrogen one it's got a mass of one because there's only one particle and it's got a proton number of one because it's only got one proton plus a second of these and this gives me in the end we end up with one particle of deuterium so that has got a mass number of two but a proton number of one we've got a positron and the way you draw a positron is because it is a positive electron it has an E but it also here has a plus one because its charge is one and its mass is zero. Now that seems a bit strange having a mass of zero but the reason for this is that electrons weigh something like two thousand times less than a proton or a neutron so their relative atomic mass is zero. Plus we've got our gamma particle there and this is an equation for this process over here right I'm going to draw an equation for this process here now oh actually before I move on to sorry the second equation here look just having a look here are the masses on the top conserved we've got a total of two over on this side a total of two good on this side we've got the charges plus that's two as well I mean one positron two sorry one proton two protons that's a charge of plus two here we must have a charge of plus two as well perfect okay situation number two oops right we start off with one hydrogen atom plus now at this stage if you want to stop the video and try and jump in and complete this equation do so and then see what I do right plus we've got our deuterium atom from the first situation and what we end up with is we've got now a particle here that's got two mass number sorry a proton number of two so this is no longer hydrogen this is helium now but its mass number is only three because it's only got one neutron I believe this is called tritium although I have to look that up and double check okay plus what else is given out a gamma ray okay let's double check mass numbers on the top add up to three, yep good, two pro two protons on this side so positive and positive charges can serve there, good so we don't need to account, we don't need to put in a positron here to make sure we've got the same, alright fine and the third and final one I'm going to do here is this one here I've got two lots of tritium here and I end up with so there's some reaction here some energy given out we've got two protons and one alpha particle so that is four he2 now on this side of look I've got a total of six on the top and a total of four on the bottom I've got four on the bottom and two on the bottom there and that's why I need my two hydrogen atoms also given out here 
so that brings me to a grand total on the top here I've got six on the top here I've got six on the bottom here I've got four one two three four so I've conserved my mass numbers my proton numbers and if I conserve the proton numbers then I've definitely conserved charge as well so I should have put a three in there so you know this is equation three but basically what I've gone and done through here is do a series of equations that show what's happening at these different stages and you may be expected in your exam to do something similar you'll be given either pictures and then you've got to draw some equations for it or maybe ask what you start off with and what you end up with and I can't predict exactly what's going to come up but you just need to go through and apply these processes make sure that you conserve the number of particles and you conserve the charge and if they are not conserved if you've got a glaring emission there it may be that you've got these positrons are in place now this is specifically mentioned being able to cope with dealing with positrons in the syllabus in the exam syllabus so you need to be aware that this might raise its head however the exam board is they're not going to expect you to remember this by heart so you're not expected to memorize it but they are expected you they are expecting you to be familiar enough with it to perhaps draw an equation perhaps go from an equation to drawing some pictures or to to talk generally about the situation and they certainly would expect you to be able to use the E equals MC squared equation where you've got the total energy is equal to the mass loss multiplied by C squared where C is the speed of light and they'll give you their value of the speed of light as well I don't they wouldn't ask you to memorize the speed of light okay a couple of final points about fusion in stars so in stars hotter stars when the temperature and the pressure get really really high they can fuse heavier elements together so our Sun at the moment is fusing hydrogen all of the time to make helium but there are stars that are bigger and hotter and heavier where you fuse carbon and carbon or where you fuse oxygen and oxygen and you can fuse anything up to and you're able to produce in stars by fusion can produce all the elements up to iron every element in the chemical table every chemical or every element in the periodic table up to and including iron are all produced by fusion inside stars so this process is basically the factory all stars yeah they're the factories where elements are made this is how elements get made in the universe inside stars and this process occurs in the core of a star and this is where the temperature and pressure are at their highest now we're going to look a little bit later in another video at the structure of stars this, that's to be discussed but you should be remembering this fusion occurs in the core which is the very center of the star the hottest most highly pressured part and there we can get small elements to fuse into larger ones and release huge amounts of energy now it's time for our wrap up let's give it everything we've got ready begin to summarize what fuels the Sun well it sure isn't combustion because combustion would not produce enough energy given the materials that the Sun is made out of also there's not enough oxygen supply in space for this to be a viable option our studies of the nuclear realm lead us to understand that it's nuclear fusion that is responsible this is where you get small particles 
or yeah, smaller elements fuse under extreme temperature and pressure to form larger elements. This fusion it is done by the strong nuclear force. It's where the strong nuclear force forces them together and when we get that strong nuclear force forcing them together the, there is a mass difference a change in mass. Sometimes you see it with this triangle to so show there's a change in mass. There's a difference in mass between how heavy the large elements are and how heavy the small elements are. This accounts for the energy difference. The energy is equal to this change in mass or the lost mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. So huge, huge, huge amounts of energy are formed we can write nuclear equations for these and we need to make sure that we conserve the number of particles that is the number of protons, number of neutrons and we conserve charge when we're doing these nuclear equations also as a final point fusion can produce all the elements up to iron inside stars and the hotter the star the heavier the elements it can produce and finally this whole process takes place at the very center of the star which is called the core, which is its hottest, densest, most forceful part. And that is where we get all this energy from. And it's, it's a staggering amount of energy. Huge, huge, huge payoff for energy. The amount of energy that you can get from one kilogram of coal compared to one kilogram of hydrogen, it would be thousands and thousands and thousands of times as much energy. So it's a hugely efficient, massive payoff process. And it's no surprise that humans are trying to look into a way of doing nuclear fusion on planet Earth. Because if we can do that, it would solve our energy problems once and for all. The end. Actually, I say the end. I'm just going to, um, there's a little section of a song that's going to play us out to do with the amount of energy produced in a star and uh, this is one of my favourite songs, so enjoy. One of my favourite songs ever. Enjoy. Hydrogen bursts inside a star Don't mean a lot From whereabouts we are is too far for your skull, but you 